You are watching Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Um, today, I'm just going to uh, play you a long, uh, I guess, webinar that I did um, over at the Securities Commission very recently. Uh, this is because uh, SIDC uh, recently held a webinar uh, to talk about sustainable and renewable investments, or SRI. Within it, the context we were talking about ESG, or environmentally, socially governance uh, friendly investments, uh, and many other uh, alphabet soup, as you would uh, in terms of talking about the investments there. Um, in that uh, panel that I had, I had Monum Salim, uh, the EVP or the Executive Vice President of Saturna Capital, as well as Amri Sofian of Dana Jamin. He's a Chief Corporate Investment Officer there. Um, so Monum and Amri um, had a very co robust conversation with me because I was testing on the idea of having a uniformed method of reporting um, on uh, SRI initiatives by investment firms or fund managers trying to understand a little bit better about how the reporting is done from the corporates themselves. Uh, so the idea here is we're trying to distinguish the job. The title here is Distinguishing Fluff from the Real Stuff when it comes to SRI. So here is the clip. Enjoy it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, for Ibrahim, and thanks for allowing me to be here today. I mean, I think that yeah, what I wanted to talk about regarding the fluff versus what's actually practical is the idea of transparency, right? And uh, that transparency comes from two different angles. Number one is from the investment manager perspective, and the other one is from the company that's actually putting out the uh, ESG scores or ESG materials. Now, from a company, perspective though uh, you know it, it let's let's be honest um, it is a costly endeavor um, to be able to know um, to be able to filter through and figure out what is important what's not and be able to put it out there and and for the longest time when when ESG first started what what companies would do is they just put everything out there under the sun whatever they think they uh, they thought that was good they basically put it out there and then slowly over time um, it began to change where we really got into this this idea of what's material the materiality of something is it really important to the company um, to be able to report it so for example you know a carbon score for an oil and gas producer is important whereas it might not be as much for an investment management firm or some other firm so you know putting everything out there um, didn't really make any sense so um, that's one thing that 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 that's that's there where we have to be able to distinguish and say you know what is a company really imp uh, uh, reporting that's actually material to that the second thing is, is that you have to talk about um, what's important to the, the region that you're actually speaking to. What we find when we're doing investment management is that uh, uh, in the European and the developed world, you know, the, the, the um, companies like MSCI or ICON from Thomson Reuters, they have come up with their scoring methodology. And a lot of times the emerging markets or the developing market countries, they don't uh, conform, meaning that they always will get a low score. And the reason is, is that uh, what's material maybe in emerging markets is not necessarily material in the developed world. And so that has to be kind of uh, kind of screened out as well when you're talking about, uh, you know, fund management. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think that that kind of gives a, a big, uh, a little bit of an understanding maybe of, of why materiality is really important in a company. That was very insightful in terms of trying to find what is uh, important or what is material within the context of the markets that they operate in. Um, let's uh, toss it over to Amri. Uh, Amri, let's uh, hear a few words uh, from you on this matter. Uh, thank, thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, I think a couple of things just to add on to what Monam uh, just has shared. Uh, you probably talk about uh, the, the point of view or the lens from the uh, government or even the regulator's point of view. Uh, I'm talking about a Malaysian context here where I, I think today uh, there are a number of initiatives. Uh, there are a number of efforts being done, uh, but probably I think want to see more in terms of what uh, the regulators or the government can do trying to actually push uh, for further uh, initiative on a green angle. Uh, so, so, so that's one. And then two, uh, I think Monim touched a bit about the investor side as well. And I think uh, today, uh, I think uh, the, the big players or the institutional players like the EPF, the Co-op, or even Kazana actually are trying to push in terms of them buying more of the ESG bonds or, or papers. But I think I would like to see a bit more initiative given by the government trying to get other investors to come in as well in particular the other corporate players uh, for them to actually invest in, in ESG. So you talk about issuer point of view and then you also probably want to actually make sure that you have a steady 
increase in investor base of wanting to actually buy ESG papers. Uh, then you probably see a bit of traction in terms of uh, issuer wanting to issue, and then you got the investors wanting to actually buy those papers as well. Uh, thank you. So I think uh, there's two things, again, uh, coming from added, and I'm, I'm going to take two different angles this time. One is from the fund manager perspective, and the other one is the investors who are buying into the funds. So the fund manager perspective is really important that when a company discloses information, you really try to get to what are the real numbers behind it. So for example, if company says, you know, we have a goal of, of being carbon neutral by, uh, uh, you know, in, in a few years, really as an investor, you have to ask them the right question, which is how many years is it going to take? How are you going to get there? And what are the real plans behind it? Because anybody can say they're going to have a goal, but as if they have something, uh, some meat behind it, as goals are how they're going to get it, then as, as, a, as an investment manager, I would feel more confident that yes, it's, they're taking it more seriously than just putting out uh, um, something that's out there that's fluff or other words, otherwise be greenwashing. Um, the second one is from the perspective of the investor buying into the funds, and that's a little bit of a different uh, formula. And that is what you're doing there is not really uh, looking at companies themselves, but you're really looking at the fund manager. What type of disclosures are they making in their prospectuses and in their, in their offering documents that say how they're going to do that? Now, obviously, if a fund manager integrates their ESG into their research process when buying companies, that's going to be better than a fund manager that just buys regular companies and has a small department of maybe two or three people running ESG, and they're going to tell the fund, a fund manager whether or not they're allowed to buy the stock or not buy the stock. So really, I think that's one of the key areas that I think investors should look at, which is make sure that the fund manager has the, their ESG processes integrated into the research that they're doing on the companies that they're working on. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll follow up with that and say, this question you want to ask is, what have you done so far in, in, in being able to get to even 25%, 10% of the goals that you've set out for yourself? Um, that's, that's, that's the next question that's there. Then after they said, okay, we've done, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, then you can actually look at it and say, okay, is that, is that material or is it not? Um, but I don't want to uh, discount here the role of a regulator as well. And that is that uh, not, the regulator's role is not to say that, in my opinion, that these are the criteria that you should come uh, a report whenever you're reporting, but really to be able to say that when you report, that you are held responsible for what you're reporting. When you do that, then you don't get uh, the immaterial uh, uh, um, uh, fluff out there in, into the reports and those sites. So if a company tells me that they've done 10% of their 100% plan, then I know that they're telling the truth. It's, it's really something that's there because they're gonna be held responsible if they're not telling the truth. I think that's really important from a regulatory perspective that, 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 is, that, that is put into the mix. Amri, let's bring into the context yeah, of Malaysia right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, you wanna add something? Yeah, let me, let me just add something else to Ibrahim. I, I think a uh, couple of things here. Uh, you're talking about one thing to actually make this uh, as part of uh, everyone's BAU. If you recall, maybe like Islamic finance, I think it, it sort of like started maybe like 30 years ago. I think in Malaysia, for example, then I think there's some sort of certification being rolled out by regulators for people to actually understand Islamic finance better. Right? Maybe perhaps I think uh, a context is actually for a, a global or, or unison certific certification out there for people to actually go and learn about it. So they get a bit more understanding about what is green, what is SRI. Then maybe with that kind of knowledge that they have, right, uh, being certified as well, then they can actually can ask those questions when they attend any analyst meeting or any PLCs, uh, quarterly updates and all that in terms of uh, where they are on the process of, of make it green, you know, not just talking about that, you know, first level of question, but you follow up with the second or third level of question. So this point number one, talking about certification, right? Uh, the, the other point that maybe you can consider is actually uh, maybe the disclosure within the PLC can be a little bit more robust. I know today uh, Busa did uh, uh, actually en en uh, enforce a certain disclosure requirement being made uh, in the PLC annual report. But you can see that that information that being given out is actually not, uh, not unison, not, not, there's, there's no standard being, being given out. So it's up to the PLC to disclose what they want to disclose, right? Uh, in order to actually get people to be on the same page, probably perhaps to actually have some sort of like minimum uh, disclosure requirement uh, for PLC to report on an annual basis on what they have done uh, on a green stuff or an SRI and all that. So make the user, make the analyst, make the investor 
uh, better informed on, on the process. Uh, we'll go for a short break. When we come back, we'll continue on this uh, conversation of SRI investments. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for staying on with us. Uh, just as I mentioned earlier, I have with me Monum Salam of uh, the uh, Saturna uh, Capital. Uh, he's calling in from uh, the US. Uh, we have also Amri Sofian of Dana Jamin talking about SRI investments. Uh, here's the clip. Well, it won't be easy, Rahim, that's for sure. Uh, but you can see, take, take for example, I think in the UK, uh, what, what I was informed is that uh, there's actually a requirement for all the PLC companies to actually disclose within the director's report. You know, in, in the annual report, there's actually a lot of segments, but within the director's report itself, there's actually a requirement uh, for the UK PLC companies to report on three things. Uh, number one is actually on uh, erosion or carbon uh, emission, for example. Uh, number two, on human rights. And the third thing on diversity, right? So you can see that when people read the annual report, you know, after flipping first couple of pages, right? Then you, you sort of like read the director's report. Then from there, you probably see a bit more uh, disclosure about what the company has done uh, in terms of uh, trying to be sustainable uh, for the next few years. As, as compared to how you put it, Ibrahim, that, you know, I mean, most of the disclosures are actually at the back end of the annual report, right? You know, so you take some time for you to actually flip those pages until you got the back end. So in the UK, they make it a compulsory that those information needs to actually put it within the director's report so that the user or the reader will read it in the first instance and actually flip through the annual report, right? Uh, to, to make it, uh, I call it easier for people to read, I think that, it, I mean, come back to my earlier point about trying to actually have a uniform disclosure uh, within that, that segment as well so that you, you can see the same set of uh, data being published by the PLC or by the corporates. Right? You make it easy for people to actually compare between a company A and a company B in terms of what they have done on uh, 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 green, uh, 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 green initiatives. Right? So from there, then you can also take that information for your investment decision. You say that I want to buy only those companies that actually have a certain credit scoring of, let's say, more than 50%. Today, in Malaysia's context, you know, that information is there, like how you put it, but it's not uniform. It's not consistent. So take, for example, like a, a company in Malaysia within the same industry, take plantation, for example, we have a two separate reportings talking about green. Right? You know, so as a user, it's, it's, it's difficult for you to actually read and also compare uh, and try to make that uniform decision uh, about their green initiatives. So I want to add yeah. a little bit, if you don't mind. Uniform uh, 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 disclosure uh, um, and also minimum climate disclosure. What do you think of these two things? So there's a there's used to be a, a, an old joke that said, you know, that the heavier the annual report is, the more more things a company has to be hiding. And so I think for the for the case of sustainability, it's it's very simple. It's called K I S S, like keep it simple, stupid. Um, and so you know, it, it, you don't need to have a large report. Again, I'm going to go back to this, and it has to do with materiality, right? A, a bank, for example, that talks about how they're going to be saving the, the environment there's something wrong there. They have to be more talking about diversity, uh, you know, how, how they uh, uh, um, do uh, going after the unbanked, you know, those type of things, so the S part, the E part, uh, the G part, whereas maybe an environmental company that focuses more on the G part and the S part, there's something wrong because they really need to be focusing on the E part. As far as standards are concerned, I think Amri's, Amri's right to a certain level. I think the standards need to be com coming about from an industry perspective, not from a regulator or anything else. And the reason is because what Brahim Ochu mentioned, which is that if you give somebody a standard, they're only going to live up to that standard and that's it. Whereas if you let the industry decide what's material and then after that come up with those standards, they're constantly going to be changing. One of the things uh, Amri mentioned was about Islamic, Islamic finance versus ESG. And the Islamic finance, because we're actually borrowing the, the, the actual and ideas of investing from a holy book, they're pretty static over the long run. From an ESG perspective, they're constantly going to be changing. What is ESG now, hopefully, will not be what's ESG 10 years from now because we would have graduated from this idea of, you know, are you not no longer carbon neutral because everybody is, and we're getting into the next phase, which would be, you know, maybe carbon, uh, carbon minus or something along those lines. So it, it, there has to be some dynamism in even the ESG screens so that we can keep moving the needle more and more towards a, a better and healthier planet. 
that's, that's, that's a very good point, Ibrahim. Uh, I mean, being being a fellow uh, chartered accountant as well, you know, so you're bound by by a lot of disclosures and guidelines and reporting needs, right? Uh, and I think it also fosters behavior uh, from the CFO point of view, as well as uh, the company's standpoint to say that to make sure that they are actually adhering to a certain, I call it, uniform uh, standards out there. So, so I think your point is actually today there are quite a number of uh, bodies that actually cover different aspects of 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 uh, ESG, right? You know, I think that makes it difficult for anyone, not just in Malaysia, but talking about trying to actually bring this to a global standard, right? I think what the unit is probably a standard setter globally to actually say that these are the minimum requirements that cover certain aspect of the E, the S, and the G as well that being applied to all companies that want to actually uh, be in full compliance of the ESG requirements, right? So it's, it's a good point, but I think what the challenge I can see from there is trying to implement that, trying to operationalize that. Even accounting standards, as you know, Ibrahim, that, you know, it takes a while before everyone gets together to say that, okay, let's have a uniform standard body or accounting standards framework out there that cover the whole wide world. Even that also between the US, and the UK, there are different, I call it interpretation or application when it comes to certain accounting standards. So you can imagine that you want to actually do this on a global uh, environment or global setting, it requires a lot of push from everyone to say, okay, this has to be done. But the good thing is actually is that the ESG, like how, uh, how modern code is actually, is that it's actually individual kind of like perspective. Right? It's not that I'm, I'm Malay, I'm Chinese and all that. It's actually something that you want to do for the better of the country, for the better good of the, of the world, and to actually do something for the next generation. So maybe the implementation is a challenge, but it can be done uh, at a certain point if anyone actually puts their head together wanting to actually make this uh, 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 a success. No? Um, sure. So I think uh, a couple of things I'll just uh, piggyback off of. Uh, what uh, what Amri just mentioned. So first of all, there is um, uh, now more um, reporting standards that are becoming standardized. Uh, you know, Michael Bloomberg actually running a task force uh, for for the global reporting standards. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. If you compare that to um, uh, the kind of like what what the accounting is, you can have some international standards and then have it custom local region or country. So for example, even in accounting, you have the IFRS. But then there are some MFRS as well that kind of localize it to the Malaysian context as well. So um, that's definitely the case because if you come up with global, global standards, the problem becomes is that a lot of the emerging, emerging markets, which are um, you know, having to deal with commodities and, 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 and gas and plantations, you know, they can quickly be eliminated from, um, uh, from being positively ESG, uh, of course. And so you have to have a context to to, to these reporting standards. So, uh, so thank you for that. So the first thing is, as I mentioned, was on the regulatory side is the regulator should not be responsible for saying this is what you report, but rather saying whatever you do report is actually accurate and will hold you responsible. That's the key. Um, and so, uh, so that that be a very, very important aspect of it. Then from there, um, you know, the industries can come into play and they can, you know, what material in, uh, for us is gonna, you know, X, Y, Z, ABC is not really that important. Um, and the way you get me on board with this is you help to the fund owners, not the actual companies themselves. When people when companies realize that it, they can basically have a, a, a X factor more investors, they have, have ESG standards, then they are going to naturally be towards actually having those ESG standards in place. And, and so if you say that, that for no ESG, um, you know, European fund managers or fund owners will not buy into any any company that doesn't have any ESG kind of disclosures. Then a company says, you know what, I can increase my market cap just by having these disclosures. Yes, let's take a look at how this is done. So there is a demand side of it, which is the fund owner kind of de uh, helping demand uh, uh, demand that these disclosures be made. But at the same time, uh, um, the industry needs to kind of come together and say, this is what we want. And then the regular comes and says, you can report whatever you want, guys. But if you report it, you better stick to it. I, I think the answer is a firm yes, Ibrahim. Uh, you, you are right. I think uh, the corps, the EPFs, uh, Kazanas, I think they're taking the lead wanting to actually invest more on ESG papers or bonds. 
uh, maybe you're talking about wanting the industry to drive. Maybe the regulator can be behind the scene wanting to make sure that that's being done as well. And I think to the uh, companies like EPF and Coop and all that, I think they also probably need a bit of push as well in terms of maybe a certain tax breaks or certain incentive for them to say that if I actually buy and invest on ESG papers, what do I get in return? Yes, apart from trying to actually be green and all that. And then maybe also you're talking about wanting to invest to earn a certain return. Right? Uh, it comes back to the dollars and cents. Right? Uh, so you can't run away with that. Uh, so, so maybe from the regulatory point of view, it's actually to continue introducing uh, many other initiatives. Uh, I know there are quite a number of uh, tax breaks, uh, tax exemptions being doled out, out there. Uh, but I think uh, there could be probably a bit more effort being put to actually encourage more uh, 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 incentives to be given to investors themselves. I think today the, the, the initiative or the incentive are given more for the issuer of the, of the ESG or the, the green bonds, uh, but not so much, I would say, in terms of the investor point of view. I have some, but I'll let Emory go first if, if you want to. <laughs> Uh, Ibrahim, I think, uh, again, you're talking about dollars and cents, you're right, you know, I think as an investor, you probably look at what investment that I can make or invest that just make more return. Uh, the moral situation will come probably a bit later. Uh, in, in today's market, uh, I would say that in terms of the real pickup, especially for bonds and support when it comes to green as compared to uh, other non-green papers, uh, there's so much difference. Uh, so again, investors are uh, uh, able to actually choose depending on what can actually offer me a higher return. Uh, if you're talking about equity market, uh, I think I saw this somewhere that uh, if you compare between a uh, food C4 good, uh, that's a Malaysian uh, index that actually uh, uh, disclosed about 71 counters, uh, uh, that actually ESG sort of like driven by ESG as compared to let's say uh, the KSCI over three years, uh, the total return for the uh, uh, ESG uh, equity is actually slightly higher compared to uh, the KSCI. I was told actually uh, the total return over the three years is about 12% for those counters under uh, FTSE for good as compared to eight, only 8% uh, for, for those uh, under the KSCI. Uh, if you go slightly, uh, if you go further up, let's say globally, uh, you can see the same trend. Uh, MSCI, for example, for the emerging ESG uh, leaders, they actually have outperformed uh, the MSCI emerging markets uh, over a longer run. Uh, in fact, during difficult times as well, uh, you can see that those uh, MSC uh, emerging ESG leader actually are a bit more re resilient as compared to the uh, MSCI emerging markets. Uh, so, so you, you're talking about uh, uh, coming back to uh, what the investor is looking at, and I think it comes back to still uh, what can actually I invest to make a higher return. Uh, so in that context, uh, you can't run away to what you just said, Ibrahim, to say that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, if it's cheaper, it's better return, I'll go for it. If I think also if regulator wants to come in, it's actually to look in terms of, again, incentive for the investors i.e. further tax breaks if you're saying you invest in uh, ESG bonds or suku as compared to uh, non-ESG bonds. Uh, interest, uh, let's say interest income deduction or something like that, uh, that can be applied to uh, uh, companies for, let's say, year assessment uh, now until, let's say, uh, three years from today. You know, just to spur uh, a bit more investors to come in to buy those papers. Uh, Monam, would you like to add? Thank you. Yes, I do actually. So, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, in our Islam, 50% of our investors are non-Muslim. And so what we like to say is money is agnostic. It's going to chase the returns, as you mentioned, um, uh, where, where, wherever they can find it. Um, and so, but, but when you look at ESG, you have to look at it from a little bit more longer term perspective. It's not only about the alpha, right? It's the return generation, but it's also about the beta, which is the risk mitigation. And a lot of times the outperformance comes not, uh, um, you know, immediately, sometimes it does, but over the longer term, what you find is that larger the ESG leaders, they are going to be the ones that are less risk, of, um, that they're more risk averse and they don't go down as much when you have um, uh, a certain thing that happen. And so that's really where ESG begins to shine, right? If you look at, for, for example, the oil spills, uh, Diamond Offshore, um, you look at BP, um, you know, you're going to find is that, you know, BP was doing well uh, for a long time until they didn't because they had an oil spill. It was basically billions of dollars were wiped out of the market, uh, off the market just because of one thing that happened. Now, 
that can happen automatically, that's a risk mitigation. To look at. So if you combine both of those together. No, no, sorry, go ahead, sorry, go, ahead. You were saying? Uh, go Finish your thought, please. Okay, so before, uh, combining both of those together, you're gonna find is in the long run, and actually the indices will kind of prove that, is that you will end up with the outperformance of ESG versus a conventional index. Um, thanks very much for watching. I hope that was a good conversation. Uh, just to recap, we were talking about growing the SRI investor base by providing true measures of sustainability commitments. Uh, we were talking about ESG ranking as an accurate representation of an organization's commitment to the cause. Uh, we're also um, championing transparency and materiality because uh, as uh, Monum was talking about, what would be material in this part of the world might not be material in other parts of the world, what would be material in some industries might not be material in other industries. So those are the kind of, I guess, general ideas that we were talking about at length uh, in this webinar. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that particular episode. Um, if you've missed any part of this conversation, just head on to astroawani.com. Uh, look for a notepad over there. Plenty of interviews like this can be found there. Till then, thanks very much for watching and goodbye.